this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jeremy and Robin Spielbauer? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Jeremy and Robin Spielbauer lived in Amarillo, Texas. The couple had married in 2005 and had two daughters. Their relationship was turbulent and described as on again, off again. They had financial problems and argued frequently. Eventually, they started attending a local church. They seemed very excited about this and went three times a week. There they met a woman named Katie Phipps, who was a single mother of two. It would appear as though three visits to church a week were not enough to learn morality because Jeremy and Katie started having an affair. In 2012, Robin divorced Jeremy. In November of 2013, Jeremy married Katie. The relationship between Robin and Katie was rocky, mostly because of the infidelity part. On multiple occasions, they physically fought each other. In 2014, Katie started to suspect that Jeremy and Robin were having an affair. She was extremely offended by this completely predictable betrayal. Katie could not understand how Jeremy could ever be unfaithful to her, even though their relationship started with him being unfaithful to Robin. Robin appeared to enjoy getting a measure of revenge against Katie. Like now, Katie understood how it felt to be betrayed. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Delete Me. Over the last few years, I've covered a lot of stalking cases, which involve perpetrators easily finding personal information online. When people try to get this information removed, they find that it's extremely time-consuming. Fortunately, there's a solution. Delete Me is a subscription service that can eliminate this type of personal information that is for sale online. They have the straightforward mission of removing customers' information from search results and upholding your right to manage and remove your personal information. The privacy experts at Delete Me work continually to remove information from over 750 data brokers. This gets rid of your personal data like address, occupation, marital status, age, names of relatives, and so on. How does it work? Submit your information to Delete Me and their experts remove it. After that, they check every three months to make sure any new data get removed as well. If you want to get your personal information removed from search results on the web, Go to joindeleteme.com slash Dr. Grande. Delete Me is offering 20% off their privacy plans to all my viewers with my code, Dr. Grande. Again, that's joindeleteme.com slash Dr. Grande, promo code, Dr. Grande. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On April 8, 2014, Robin Spielbauer was discovered on Helium Road, which is a dirt road not far from her home. She was on the ground motionless near the rear passenger tire of her Chevrolet Tahoe. The police were notified and arrived on the scene. They found that Robin was dead. She had been killed late on April 7. Robin had sustained blunt force trauma and had been shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber firearm. The police found a 22 caliber case on the ground not far from Robin's body, as well as pieces of pink plastic they also found pink smears on the window of the Chevrolet Tahoe, like paint transfer from something pink being smashed against the window. The police spoke to Jeremy, as he was an obvious potential suspect. He claimed that he was at home at the time of the murder. He watched TV with his uncle. When his uncle left, he fell asleep on the couch. Jeremy said that Katie was at a friend's house. The police reviewed data from Jeremy's cell phone, which raised concerns. Therefore, they interviewed him again. Jeremy stayed with the story that he was at home. He said that he woke up at around 9.40 or 9.50 p.m. and called his uncle because he had an uneasy feeling. At 10.18 p.m., he sent a text message to Robin, which read, Is everything okay? At about 10.20 p.m., Katie returned to the house. Jeremy's uncle pulled in right behind her and was able to verify her arrival time. Jeremy denied having any plans to meet with Robin that night. The problem for Jeremy is that he exchanged text messages with Robin 
that indicated they had plans. At 9.20 p.m., Jeremy wrote a text message to Robin, which read, You about ready. Robin responded with the word, Yup. This was the last message sent from her cell phone. Confronted with this information, Jeremy changed his story. Now he was saying that he did plan on meeting Robin at his house at 9.30 p.m. to talk about the children. She never showed up, but he didn't notice because he found himself busy doing other things. He completely forgot about the meeting. The police interviewed Katie, as she was another potential suspect. She denied any involvement in the murder and said that she and her son were at a friend's house until 10 p.m. on the night of the murder. The friend later said that Katie left sometime around 9.50 p.m., which gave Katie enough time to commit the murder. Katie asked if Jeremy was cheating. The officer told her that there were text messages between Jeremy and Robin. Katie acted as though she was surprised that Jeremy had been unfaithful. Looking at Katie's cell phone data, it was clear she already knew about the affair. She had sent many text messages to Jeremy about it. In one message, she wrote, quote, If Robin breaks any of my blank when you bring her home, I'll break her nasty face, unquote. A day later, she sent another message saying, quote, I'll hurt every single one of you on my way out, unquote. On the day of the homicide, Katie wrote, quote, I caught the last amount of disrespect from you and your blank ex-wife, unquote. About an hour before the murder, Katie wrote, quote, My dreams of a happy family are gone. I will not make you carry this burden any longer. You started this whether you want to believe it or not. I will finish it, unquote. These messages didn't look too good for Katie, but that wasn't all the evidence against her. She had posted a message on Facebook featuring a pink Sig Sauer 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. She deleted the post after the murder. The police found the pistol in the residence that Jeremy and Katie shared. The plastic pieces found at the crime scene, as well as the marks on the window of the Chevrolet Tahoe, matched the pistol. Investigators determined that the pistol was the murder weapon. On April 11, four days after the homicide, Katie was arrested. The police believed that she was responsible for the murder. Jeremy once again spoke to the police. This time he gave them a new story that implicated Katie. He said that on the night of the murder, Katie came home at around 9.30 p.m. She was in a bad mood and took his pickup truck. This is why he called his uncle and texted Robin. Jeremy admitted that he met Robin on Helium Road. When he was in Robin's vehicle, Katie drove up to the scene and was upset. Jeremy left in his pickup truck and thought Katie would follow him. When she didn't, he sent a text message asking if everybody was okay. The state agreed to grant Jeremy immunity. The agreement was void if Jeremy did not provide truthful, accurate, and complete information. The police continued to investigate Robin's murder as Katie sat in jail. They wanted to find a way to get more information about where Katie's phone was on the night of the murder by using Wi-Fi, but her Wi-Fi was off at that time. They discovered that the Wi-Fi on her son's phone, however, was active. They believed that Katie and her son were together the entire night, so if they could figure out where her son's phone had been, they would know where Katie had been as well. Investigators assumed that this location data would support their case against Katie, but it ended up exonerating her. The cell phone of Katie's son was not in the area of the crime scene on the night of the murder. The charges against Katie were dismissed. She was released from jail after spending 15 months there. The police now believe that Jeremy must have been the killer. He placed himself at the crime scene at the time of the murder, and it's clear his story about Katie was not true. She was never at the crime scene. In addition, Jeremy's cell phone data placed him there and a security camera caught his vehicle near the scene. On April 16, 2016, over two years after the homicide, Jeremy Spielbauer was arrested. In 2018, he was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Jeremy Spielbauer maintains his innocence. A major part of his defense was that Katie could have been the killer. Some people believe that Jeremy is guilty. Others believe that Jeremy and Katie worked together. 
As far as believing that Jeremy did not commit the murder, there are not a lot of people jumping on the Jeremy is innocent train. This brings me to the question, is Jeremy guilty? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Jeremy is guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Jeremy had an affair with Katie when he was married to Robin. Then he had an affair with Robin when he was married to Katie. Telling the truth was not his strong suit. Jeremy did not want to make child support payments. Eliminating Robin and framing Katie for her murder would solve all his child support problems at one time. Jeremy supplied the police with four different versions about what happened on the night of the murder. He admitted that he was with Robin at the scene of the crime, and other evidence placed him there as well. Robin was killed with a pistol that Jeremy had access to. Jeremy did not have an alibi for the time of the murder. In theory, Katie could have been the killer instead of Jeremy, but cell phone data indicated she was not at the crime scene. Moving to the exculpatory factors, the gun that killed Robin was owned by Katie. Cell phone data is not always accurate. Perhaps Katie was at the crime scene despite what the data indicated. In addition, the data that excluded her was not from her phone, but rather from her son's phone. Katie left her friend's house at 9.50 p.m. and showed up at her house at 10.20 p.m. A half hour was enough time to commit the murder. Katie had sent threatening messages about Robin to Jeremy not long before the murder. Originally, the state charged Katie with the murder. How could they be certain that they were wrong in charging her and correct about charging Jeremy? The state's theory of the crime was that Jeremy framed Katie for Robin's murder, but Jeremy's attorney argued that Jeremy was not intelligent enough to develop and execute such a plan. This assertion was supported by investigators, who described Jeremy as dim-witted. As I mentioned, he couldn't get anyone to climb aboard the Jeremy is Innocent train. However, the Jeremy is not Intelligent train was over capacity, and there was a waiting list. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Jeremy is guilty? Yes, I think that Jeremy is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It makes no sense that an innocent man would provide four different versions of his story about the night of the murder. I believe that Katie had nothing to do with the crime. Moving to the next question, how did Jeremy manage to manipulate two women and almost successfully frame one of them for the murder of the other? As I mentioned, both Jeremy's attorney and investigators agreed about Jeremy's low intellectual capabilities. He did not seem to be a criminal mastermind. Jeremy also did not appear to have a lot of skill in managing romantic relationships. Here's what I think happened in this situation. This is just a theory, my opinion. Jeremy had the ability to manipulate at a very basic level and encountered women with extremely low standards who were highly vulnerable to his limited superficial charm. This is who he tended to attract. For these women, physical attraction was not a major motivator for romance. Rather, they were desperate to have anyone pay attention to them. When Robin and Katie found themselves as romantic rivals, they focused on each other instead of Jeremy's bad behavior. Much of their anger was misplaced. This led to Katie building a trail of threatening text messages. Eventually, Jeremy wanted to be free from both Robin and Katie. He realized that it would be easy to murder Robin and frame Katie because of the animosity between them. The extent of his master plan was to use Katie's firearm. That was really all he had as far as an idea. As it turns out, Jeremy killed Robin during a time when Katie did not have an alibi, at least not initially. This was just luck. As Jeremy kept desperately changing his stories in an effort to escape responsibility, the police interpreted this as him trying to protect Katie. Once the police focused on Katie, they developed confirmation bias and tunnel vision. Katie agreed to take two so-called lie detector tests. The police claimed that she failed both of them miserably. This is like suggesting the Easter Bunny was trying to tackle Santa Claus, but missed him by a mile. Would it matter if he missed him by two miles? A polygraph is pseudoscientific nonsense. A person cannot fail or pass a polygraph, but the police were living in a fantasy world where science and reason did not matter. Fortunately, the prosecutor was willing to admit his mistake and eventually pursued Jeremy as the killer. Now moving to my final thoughts. Perhaps accidentally, 
Jeremy caused a situation where women were fighting over him. When he was asked how he did this, Jeremy implied that he was puzzled because he was not attractive. When the state tried to figure out who committed the murder, they discounted Jeremy because he was dim-witted, submissive, and meek. They thought he must have been under Katie's control. It's fairly common to see killers who are attractive, confident, and manipulative, but Jeremy was the complete opposite. It's frightening to consider what could have happened in this case if Jeremy was actually a competent criminal, considering how far he made it being incompetent. Those are my thoughts on the case of Jeremy and Robin Spielbauer. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.